Awesome. Well, thank you guys for uh, showing up and coming to our session on openness. Um, we've got a whole bunch of great folks. Um, so I just want to quickly ask, I don't know the demographics of the folks in the room, so how many of you are teachers or educators, faculty? OK. And what are you? A graduate student. All right, great. Um, well, faculty members, that's great. That's exactly who we'd like to be talking to. Um, are you all here on main campus at the law school? Main campus? Main campus. Yes. Cool. All right, that was easy enough. <laughs> that's what I need to know. Um, just to really quickly, uh, we'll just introduce ourselves and then we can kind of dive in on the material. Um, my name is Ethan. I'm based over uh, at WCL in the program on information justice and intellectual property. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm like everyone I work with, um, but I do work with uh, the Creative Commons chapter, which is a nonprofit organization that created alternative licenses to the traditional all rights reserved copyright. So we do a lot of advocacy around sharing information and um, uh, unlocking innovation, that sort of thing. Um, so that's what I spend my time doing. My background is mostly in campaigns and organizing work. Um, and so I do a lot of work around open education and affordability for students, that sort of thing. Hi, I'm Kim Westmeyer. I work in CTRL, um, so you'll see me kind of running around all day. Um, but for, for this time, I'm sitting here uh, with you having a conversation, which is awesome. Um, I am an instructional designer in CTRL. And what that means is, is I work with faculty on improving or fine tuning or collaborating on teaching practices. Um, so if you have any ideas that you would like to talk about, talk through, see if I have any ideas, then I love being with faculty. It's the best job ever, I think, um, a great campus. So um, my contact information will be up there. Um, so if you'd like to talk about OERs or teaching in general, uh, we, can, we can do that. So I'm Michelle Lansigan, and I'm a term faculty in the chemistry department. Uh, I teach mostly um, non uh, science for non majors, and so the language is a bit different compared to when I'm teaching to majors. And so I developed an OER at the time, it was Lindsay Murphy. I developed an OER specifically tailored for 10 100 students. I'll talk about that more. Hi, I'm Steph Woods. I actually am one of those attorneys, although I'm <laughs> not currently practicing. I teach uh, American Studies, and I worked with Lindsay also in CTRL to revamp uh, our Intro to American Studies course using all open educational resources. I'm also the faculty director for AUX1. Awesome. Oh, sorry. I skipped. I forgot to advance the slide. Um, and I do want to say thanks. Like, obviously, it's really awesome to have Kim here, considering she's, you know, helping organize this whole conference. And I think Steph, you're on, like, three other panels today or something along those lines. So, <laughs> I'm grateful for all three of you to be here to talk about this. Um, so I just really want to start out kind of on the more general front, talking about the problem of high textbook prices. Um, obviously, we live in a very challenging climate for higher education. Sort of, There's a lot of pressure on institutions. There's a lot of pressure on state governments. And there's a lot of pressure on students, especially when it comes to finances. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, we focus on tuition, we focus on room and board because those are the biggest tickets, those are the big line items. Um, but the problem and the thing that makes textbooks unique is that they're often out of pocket and they're often purchased after all financial aid has been allotted and things like that. So they can have a really disproportionate impact on students. Um, we know because of the high cost of textbooks, lots of students don't buy their books. Um, as faculty members, you've probably experienced that in your classrooms, but hopefully not. Um, and even worse, I think the more concerning piece is that the cost of textbooks is starting to impact students' learning pathways and their progress towards graduation. We've seen about 50% of students say that textbook prices impact how many classes they take. Um, and that's just sort of a very warped way for education to be happening, where the price is deterred, like the price of the book itself is determining the progress towards graduation and ability to take classes. Um, and then, you know, sort of taking that down even further, 30% of students report using financial aid. So they're actually taking out loans to pay for books, which they'll then pay, you know, an extra 20, 30% more over the course of their loan. 
um, just to be able to keep up in class and, and do their homework assignments. Um, and then this is from a quick a report from the Institute for College Access and Success. They just asked um, financial aid recipients, what are, what are they likely to do if they can't afford their textbooks? 44% said they'd work at their job more. 23% um, said they'd take out a loan. 27% said they would drop a class if they couldn't afford the textbook. Um, and I think this just kind of starts to illustrate this really weird national thing that's happening where this one sort of relatively small cost but disproportionately impactful learning object is skewing the course of students' academics. And, and it, it's just kind of a very odd thing. So um, these are just some broader national numbers. I want to hand it over to Kim to talk a little bit more about. Yeah, so a lot, of, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, a lot of the studies that Ethan was talking about uh, really deal with public schools, two and four year institutions. And so, you know, the question that is a very valid question is does this affect students from private schools? You know, AU is a very expensive school. I think it's upwards of $60,000 now. Um, per year, and that is does not include tuition and room and board, or, excuse me, room and board. Um, and so that's a huge number. But maybe you know there's some difference there. And the answer to that question is no. Um, so uh, there was a study performed by Lindsay Murphy, who was my predecessor. Um, so if you hear Lindsay, you can kind of think of my position. Um, so Lindsay Murphy and David Rose, uh, another colleague of mine from CTRL, who's now in UCL, um, Ethan, uh, performed a study in fall 2015 to really see if these national numbers are comparable or, or what our students are really experiencing as well. And that's the name of the study, um, if you'd like to see. We'll probably post these slides after on the EdSpace site so that you can access them and, and use these figures if you'd like. Um, and yes, they are very reflective of national trends. So 67% of AU students chose not to buy a required textbook due to cost. And this is self-reporting, and this is a really, I think, a very sad number, especially when a lot of the content that uh, professors use are based upon textbooks. And it's it's really, like Ethan said, it's upsetting to me as someone who cares very deeply about the learning experience and students and, and faculty and that whole microcosm there, that something like a textbook would hold a student back from really digging in and following the whole thing. Yeah. 67, do we know how many times this happened? Um, I probably. I don't know if we did that. That's a tough one to just like, yeah. because yeah. oftentimes you're catching a student either you know we didn't I don't think it tracked what semester or like what year they were in and that would change you know the, like the number of times they would have done this yeah um, yeah the I think it's on average at least once per semester not in this study but in other research that we found like the Florida virtual campus um, has disaggregated that a little bit and yeah it's not great <laughs> Yeah, it's not super positive. Yeah, I'd say this is probably the first look that we've taken at AU, and so I think they, you know, I think the question was framed as, have you ever? Um, is this cost just because they can't afford it? Or so I know sometimes students will say things like, I'm not paying $250 for a textbook, even if they have the money. Yeah, Any so. Distinction between that? Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, okay. There's, there's a narrative comments piece that they, um, qualitatively analyzed, and we have some examples which will, they break my heart every time I see them. Uh, but yeah, but a lot of the times so that is just the it's about, it's about your problem. Yeah, exactly. So here, um, how does this change, or you know, how, how do the cost of course materials change your learning habits? So basically, they're too expensive. Um, and that then probably leads them to not buy them. Um, they also believe that they are not used in courses. They are not relevant. Um, they uh, shop around, uh, see if there's anything out there that would be comparable to aid them in their learning. Um, they think that there's negative learning effects to a textbook. 
can't hypothesize why. Perhaps it's because of the traditional high school model in the states where you just read the textbook and lecture. I'm not sure. Um, family help, illegal downloads. Um, what one number? So sorry, one yeah. thing I was going to point out. It was interesting to me that only 6.9% said it was not a problem. It's pretty low. Um, so these are the, the narrative comments that really break my heart. Um, so the one that particularly gets me is uh, the cost of textbook causes significant financial stress on me and takes away from other semester needs, food and rent. So we as professors have very little control out of outside of the classroom in that sense, but I think that if we can if we can at least relieve the burden there, then perhaps we can work as a university community to start solving these other issues. So we have the food pantry now, um, but I don't think that gets us off the hook for textbook uh, prices. Um, and yeah, so there. I mean, I try to stay away from courses, so they make choices based on you know what the textbook cost is. Um, so if if Class A has a three hundred dollar textbook, and Class B, a similar, you know, credit bearing qualification for the degree, has a textbook that's fifty dollars. Then they'll choose the fifty dollar one, even if they're more interested in the three hundred dollar textbook. Yeah. So the theme of this conference is the and, right? So it's researchers, it's educators and researchers. So. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear from all of you, like sort of which side of the coin you're interested in talking about the most, but I wanted to just do a quick overview of the other side of the coin, which is the open access and the, the access to research piece. Um, if there are any librarians in the room, journal subscriptions are incredibly expensive. Um, the average, uh, like a top university in the EU spends on average about four million every year on journal subscriptions. Um, we take that to places like University of California, it's 10 million per year. Um, and if you actually look at the ratio of journal subscription cost to library budgets over the last few years, you'll see that the lines are becoming <laughs> closer and closer and closer. And it means that libraries have way less funding to do any of the other programming, any of the other book stock, like, you know, this is the vast, vast majority of an academic library's budget is paying for subscriptions. Um, and then the other thing is that the contracts are often very secretive and ambiguous. So like a lot of this information is not public. It's not available to faculty members. Um, and then, you know, it's at the end of the day, the only people who have access to this stuff are the people who are at big institutions, <coughs> are ones. Um, when you leave campus, if you're a student, you no longer have access to that stuff when it's a hundred bucks an article. Um, and so one of the interesting thing that's, things that's happening right now is at the University of California system, um, where they are currently renegotiating their contract with Elsevier. Um, they, um, they spend $11.5 million on journals, products, and services just to Elsevier alone every year. Um, and so uh, this is actually an email they sent out to their faculty asking the faculty to refrain from participating in reviews, publishing, and um, just other support for Elsevier journals until the company comes back to them with a more favorable contract. Um, some of the things they highlight in here is that their Elsevier's profit margin is 40%. That's higher than Apple. That's higher than Facebook. Um, and so, uh, you know, you end up and sort of the other piece of this is that you end up with a lot of publicly funded research stuff that is funded by taxpayers um, being monetized and inaccessible to the public and the people who actually paid for its creation. Um, so that's sort of the flip side of the coin, kind of defining the problem in, in access to research. Um, so obviously we're here to talk about open licensing and how it impacts on both of these problems. Um, you know, I do want to recognize, though, there are a bunch of efforts by publishers to try to lower the cost of course materials right now. So, you know, you've got rental options, you've got all of these startups providing, you know, daily access, you know, $5 a day for access to a textbook. And you've got, you know, these 
uh, inclusive access models where they're offering sort of all your textbooks for a flat fee for a semester. Um, and, and I think you know, we can be objective, objectively appreciative of those things, like $60 for a textbook is much better than $300. $300 for all of your textbooks is a better deal. However, a lot of the times there's no student choice. The university actually signs that contract and the student just has to pay that fee whether they want the books or not. Um, and there's very little transparency in those negotiations as well. So like how much of the how much is being added to the tuition bill to pay for that? It's not really not available to the public, the details of those agreements. Um, so we tend to think that there's a better alternative <laughs> than this. Um, and that's where open licensing comes in. So I said I worked for Creative Commons. Creative Commons was, is basically a group of lawyers that wrote alternative copyright licenses. Um, the main difference, so the important things that are the same, is that open licenses work within the copyright system. So the author retains the copyright. They're not a method of replacing copyright or get doing away with it or anything like that. The main difference is that open licenses clearly communicate a set of permissions to the public. What you are allowed to do with this work. You're allowed to you know, use it in your classroom. You're allowed to remix it with other works. You're allowed to retain a copy of it. Um, none of those things are inherent to a traditional license. So the goal with open licensing was to clearly state, here's what you're allowed to do with this thing. Um, and then the other important difference is that instead of a one-to-one -one license, right, like when you gain a license to use a traditionally copyrighted work, um, that agreement is between the copyright holder and yourself and no one else. Um, one of the coolest parts about open licensing is that it doesn't require you to actually go and make that one-on-one -on -one agreement. The license actually grants those permissions broadly to the public. So the students can use it, the faculty member can use it um, without having to go in advance and get permission beforehand. So that's sort of the basics of an open license. Um, this is sort of a wordy slide, but um, so don't feel, don't feel the need to read all of it. Um, but uh, a group called Open Knowledge International just wrote some general principles about why open licensing is helpful. I mean, the main things are that it allows free circulation of inf information, right? We have the internet, we can share information without cost. That doesn't mean it doesn't take money to create and uh, to curate and all of that stuff. We're not saying that. Um, but it means you can reach greater circulation, have a more equitable outcome. Um, and then it also reduces the burden on the user, right? Like if you are creating something new and combining a bunch of materials. You don't have to go and seek out 40 different copyright holders to pull one image from each of their collections. You can do that because you can see the license and see exactly what's permitted. Um, and then it also creates a community where people are able to contribute to the work and to add improvements and to customize it. Right? Like how many times have you assigned a textbook and then told the students we're reading chapter one, six, seven, and then we're going back to three, and then we're going to skip to 17. Right? Like open licensing allows you to customize those materials, to, to pare that down, order it in the way that you think is best. Um, and that's sort of the last one that encourages you to create new works based on what's publicly available. Um, so when you bring that down onto the education perspective, greater equity in the classroom, We've actually seen research that shows having access to course materials increases student retention rates and student performance rates, which is not much of a shocker, but you know, when students actually have the textbook, they do better. Um, and it opens the door for faculty to innovate in their pedagogy, to incorporate the way they want to teach into the learning materials rather than the learning materials dictating how they teach. Um, and then the last one, and I, I put this in quotes, and we'll, we can talk more about this later, is that it has a high return on investment. So um, we've seen for schools that invest small amounts of money, 
huge amounts of money saved on behalf of students. So it's not a direct return on investment to the university, for example. But like the University of Massachusetts um, spent $65,000 on grants to help faculty convert their classes to open resources. And they've saved students $1.4 million in four years. Um, and we see stories like that all around the country, on the federal level, on the state level. You know, New York invested $8 million in OER in their state university system. They're at like the 15 to 20 mark. Um, oh, oh, sorry, open educational resource. <laughs> so referring to open textbooks, open learning materials, sort of the compendium of, of those things. Um, so, you know, it's not a direct money coming back to the school, but in terms of, like, compared to financial aid, where a dollar spent is a dollar saved, you, you spend $10,000 to write an open textbook. That textbook is open and freely available in perpetuity. You can use that for 10 courses. You know, thousands of students have free access to that and are saving all of that money. Cool. Um, flipping that over to research. Um, you know, I think the, the implications of more open research are, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, are relatively logical. Like if we researchers actually have access to the information they need, it opens the door for much greater innovation. Um, you know, it, it opens the door for much greater replication studies. Um, all of that stuff just sort of building on what's available and instead of, you know, groups getting NIH grants to recreate the same study year after year, they can actually have access to the previous studies and figure out how to take it a step forward. Um, and then I'll also say Springer Nature, um, a bunch of different uh, journals have tracked this, but open access research, open access articles get almost four times the rate of citations that closed articles do. And you know, again, there's a logical piece of this, which is that if more people can see it, more people can cite it. But there is also something there around the community and around you know, supporting publicly available research. Um, just my last couple things, and then I want to hand it over to these folks because they're doing this work themselves. Um, just really quickly, the state of open educational resources in the US. Um, there's 1.4 billion Creative Commons licensed works in the world. Um, this is not just educational resources. This is photos, videos, so sort of a broad strokes. PowerPoints. PowerPoints, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, OpenStax is an open textbook publisher. Um, they have about, they have a collection of 30 intro level textbooks, They're freely available to the public. You can get them in your bookstore for like $40, high quality color versions. Um, their books are in use at half of all colleges and universities in the US. Um, collectively, that we've been able to track, um, open educational resources have saved students about a billion dollars in the last eight or nine years. Um, and that number increases you know, exponentially from year to year. 16 states have passed legislation in support of OER. Uh, California, New York, Virginia, uh, Minnesota, just sort of all around the country, Nebraska, a bunch of states. And then just this year, we actually had two congressionally approved uh, grant programs supporting OER adoption and creation. Um, so a lot of progress. And you know, 10 years ago, where open educational resources were sort of a fringe concept, 50% um, of all faculty are aware of OER. And it's something like, I think, 30 or 40% have used an open educational resource in their classrooms today. And that's up from like five to 10%, maybe five years ago. Um, so some really exciting stuff on the open access front. Um, the Directory of Open Access Journals right now tracks about 12,000 different journals that are openly licensed and publicly available, three and a half million articles. Um, and just, so we're seeing huge growth um, on this, uh, not just in the US, but around the, around the world as well. So that's my super quick lay of the land. I threw everything at you <laughs> at once. Um, but I want to hand it over um, to our two educators to talk about sort of their own journeys and bring this a little closer to home. I'm not sure this will reach, but let's try.
Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, so I'm one of those professors who finished the textbook and decided to jump into the OER bandwagon. So I'm going to talk about why and how I went open. And specifically, I developed an OER textbook for my chemistry uh, course, which is Gentle for Non-Science Majors of the Molecular World. So again, I'm Michelle Lansingen. I'm in the chemistry department. And the courses I teach are Chem 100, Chem 150, and Chem 250. Um, for Chem 150, this is the chemistry of cooking. I have another colleague who developed an OER for that, of Professor Sari Rodriguez, and I use her OER as well, and so we use each other's <laughs> textbooks. So I'm going to talk about how I did it for um, Chem 100. So I came to AU in 2013, and I sort of inherited Chem 100 from a professor who I believe recently retired at the time. And so just to have something to start with, I used the textbook that he was using at the time. But at the end of 2014, I noticed it has come to my attention that not all of my students are buying the textbook. So I did a survey in my class and I asked them, have you ever not acquired a textbook because it was too expensive? So surprisingly, you have this statistic before, I got the same value, 67% yeah. yeah. who did not buy the textbook. And this is a course for non-science majors. Most of them already have a negative perception of science and I don't want them for their hating science. I want them to have you know, a good um, experience in my class. Like when they leave my classroom, I want them to have a deeper appreciation for chemistry. And I think having a textbook would give them that kind of um, experience. So what motivated me to participate in the Open American Initiative? So for one thing, in a traditional chemistry textbook, there are several chapters. And for Chem 100, we don't cover all of those chapters. Basically, I cover, I think, maybe a third to a half of the chapters. And so they will not use it for another semester, right? And the textbook is about $200. And since they will no longer use it for other courses, most of my students really opt not to purchase it. And because it's for non-science majors, I want the language to be a little bit more, you know, in layman's terms, similar examples and things like that. So I want to create something that just contains the right amount of chemistry that I want my students to learn. Basic examples. Um, you know, modern modern um, examples, you know, similar similar calculations, something like that. And so that's my main motivation. And in 2016, I believe, they offer a grant if you want to develop an OER. So I applied for that and I got it. And so I worked with Lindsay Murphy at the time. So how do you go open? It's actually a very easy process. Many professors think it's tedious and hard, but it took me just a summer, a whole summer period to work on it. So what's the process? I met with an OER project director at the time to discuss what kind of textbook I want. So previously it was Lindsay Murphy, now you can took him. And then we selected an OER source, and then we put together everything in Pressbooks. So I had no idea what Pressbook was, and I don't know how to code link text, but I learned <laughs> to uh, during this whole process. So let me just go into detail of um, each step. So it was a smooth process. I received a lot of help and support from Ms. Lindsay Murphy at that time. And the first thing that I need to do is to decide where do I get my materials. And so if you go right now to this website, um, it's an Open American um, textbook repository. They give you a bunch of these resources that you can use. So for my case, I was lucky because I just had to go to OpenStax College and I found everything I needed there. So if you go to OpenStax, uh, OpenStax College, they have this all sorts of textbooks. And for chemistry, actually, there are two types of textbooks. One is atoms first. The difference is that the sequence are just you know, jumbled up. So I chose this one. And what I did was, I chose the chapters, I chose the sections, and I rearranged them depending on how I want the flow to proceed. So it's really tailored to my teaching style, it's really tailored to what I just want to cover. So I just selected the chapters and I put them together and Lindsay helped me um, put everything in Pressbooks. And so you might ask me, what was the process of switch like? Uh, how much time did it take? How was it? Any challenges or difficulty? I think the challenging part for me was learning to work with Pressbooks because I had no idea how that works. There was a steep learning curve. I would go to Lindsay's office maybe twice a week <laughs> just to, you know, what happened? Um, am I saving stuff? You know, things like that. But there was a steep learning curve, but after you go over the hump, it's really going to be 
easy. And she gave me uh, a Pressbooks quick start guide. If I have any questions, I just go to that and I can figure things out, which is very helpful. And in terms of time span, uh, it just took me a summer period to write it. So in the end of the spring semester, I decided to use OpenStax. And then over the summer, we put everything together. It was ready to be deployed by the fall of 2016. It was a very um, smooth process. And I was um, uh, worried about copyright issues and things like that. But since it's OER, you know, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I don't want to use that term, but I wasn't worried about it. And so I, we put everything together. And of course, it's a book. You want to have a cover page, right? And so I asked Lindsay, where do I get images that I don't have to think about copyright? So she led me to Wikimedia Commons. And there's a ton of pictures there. I actually made the cover in um, PowerPoint. And she took care of the attributions, copyright licensing, and everything. And this is now the sequence that I want for my class. I even chose the kind of appendix that I want. I even removed some of the constants that they won't be using. So students so have, won't have a hard time looking for what they need. And so this is available now. And let me, let, I'm not sure if it's going to be open. But students can, when they open it, they can download it either as an EPUB file. They can open it um, in their computer, uh, online. And if they make an account, they can annotate it. They can highlight. They can mark a page. I think they can even write notes. And others can print portions. They still want the hard copy. So they have all that liberty to do that. So I asked them at the end of the fall semester, how do you access the OER? And they said most of them use it online with their laptop, tablets, or desktop. Others printed sections, and others downloaded the digital um, EPUB file. So I asked them, is it hard? Was it difficult? Do you think the quality was good? And overall, they said it's easy to navigate. It's similar to other um, textbooks in terms of content, clarity of concepts and explanations and quality of graphics, and it has helped them improve their learning in the course. I will need to do another survey to see what the effects are right now, but Chem 100 has recently been approved to be a Habits of Mind course, so I will need to edit, <laughs> so I will need to edit it again. So I'm going to be working with Kim um, over this uh, spring and summer, so it will be ready again um, for the fall semester. So if you're going to ask me, what I encourage fellow faculty to go open, of course, definitely, I'm going to recommend that. And the good thing about OER is that in a traditional textbook, if there's a new edition, you know, you ditch the old one and you buy the most recent ones. With an OER, you can change it as often as you can, and you don't have to worry about, you know, new topics, new, new, new textbooks, and so on. So it's really a good experience for me. It's a positive experience for my students as well. So if you have any questions, my contact information is here. I'm happy to discuss more about how I transitioned from textbook to OER. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> That's like the Anne Barrett. So anytime she like walks in, the Anne Barrett. <laughs> Thank you. And, <laughs> um, and I think what's great is we're here talking about open as innovative, but yet all the panelists were trying to also show you, is it really innovative or is it just online? And and I think whatever size room, and Michelle and I um, have frequently spoken on these panels, we're, we hope that everyone is leaving as an ambassador with greater understanding and appreciation and hopefully an interest in implementing in their pedagogy and their classes. And I love the press books idea. Each year I'm like, I'm going to do it. I haven't gotten there yet. So I'm here to also say, if you're thinking one portion of a class, one class, a class that several instructors in your program or department teach might be a good fit for OERs, there are a lot of different places to start. So from my experience, I too saw the email come through and I always encourage you to open any email that has grant in the title and then actually figure out what it means. Because when I saw open educational resource, OER, I didn't know what that was. And so then when I read it, it said, okay, you can move um, to use more online, openly accessible and licensed resources for your class. And I thought, 
I have the perfect class that we can do that with. Um, I came to AU from a tweet with an idea to teach a class. So I've always loved digital media and online resources, but my second full-time year here, I inherited a course that had a textbook and was told, okay, teach this textbook for this Intro to American Studies class. It's worked well, but it's a little dated. And as I was preparing the curriculum, I looked, oh, there's a more recent edition. And I was told by my, my program director, definitely get the more recent edition. Some of the examples were a little out of date. So this was 2014. They updated the front intro letter, and that was it. And slapped a new edition on the cover. There was still a chapter on MySpace in 2014. And for those of you who are familiar with social media, that really wasn't being used then. And it wasn't in a let's explore the more the initial iterations of social media. So it wasn't resonating with the students. It was just simply a way in my mind for the publisher to get an additional 80 to $90 because then students weren't going to buy the used edition. They were going to buy the new edition since that's what I was assigning, thinking they had updated things that were out of date. Um, that first semester, the majority did purchase the textbook, but several of them said, oh, well, we have the used edition. That's what we could get at the bookstore. That's what we could get online. That's what was cheaper. So I think there's that idea to say, are you getting what you actually need to approach that first day of class in the best possible position to succeed? And then turn and think, we know with ad drop that that our enrollment and counts and the people sitting in those chairs change those first two weeks. You're also putting someone in an additional potential barrier to learning and succeeding in the course. So I thought that this class was perfect. It was being taught by me and um, another colleague at the time. So we applied for the grant and we completely scrapped the textbook and went to purely open resources. But what was great about working with CTRL and a lot of the words in the slide that Michelle had, I had in my notes too. Easy and supportive. Available for any question, but the idea that um, one of the potential literary texts in American Studies, Ragged Dick by Horatio Alger, you can go online and find it. Not all of those sites are actually openly licensed. So for me to assign something, I need to make sure I'm assigning a copy that is openly licensed. Or, you know, I think working through things with Lindsay really helped me see, okay, this chapter that I find somewhere, or this infographic, or this, you know, here's where it's actually cleared in terms of open licensing and not a copyright violation that I'm then putting off to my students. Um, we also worked a lot, um, I assigned several videos for more contemporary topics like Black Lives Matter, and um, working with the same TED talk or the same video, what's accurate closed captioning and what isn't? So then it's not just saying, okay, these are both open educational resources. I can get the same video, but one is properly captioned start to finish and one isn't. So which puts more of my students in a better position to succeed and complies with, you know, complies with what we should be doing for our classes. So I would go with what's not just open educational resource, but also the most accessible option there. Um, and I think that's steered how I approach the class differently. Um, I just assign a syllabus with shortened links, and the links will update um, as sometimes sites change, but I think that's also proven to be a really good lesson in information literacy. And to send that message out to say, well, that, the link didn't work. You sent out the link and it didn't work. I said, yes. And I said, so what other options do you have? And it was like, well, could you send me the correct link? And I said, what other options? And I said, have you tried Googling? And it was, it's typically, I hadn't thought of that. I said, Google the title, Google the author. Um, and then seeing also, you know, what's paid sites and what aren't paid sites or to, you know, to access certain news outlets to say, you can go through the library. The library has you covered on that one. But if you're trying to do it just from your browser, then you're typically going to be capped at five free articles a month. And for some, it's even less. And talking about, well, what does that not just mean for information literacy, but what does that mean for how news media outlets can stay in business? 
and how publications and publishing has changed. Um, so I really felt like there was more equity and that it was a stronger class. I did incorporate some OpenStax textbooks since American Studies by its nature is interdisciplinary. So we have a little bit of a sociology textbook. Um, in other classes, I've used a bit of um, a sexuality studies textbook. And what's an important message to both learn and get out to our peers is that these are peer reviewed. They do meet the highest academic standards. Just because they are online and openly available does not mean that these are not reputable publications. So trying to reframe and change the dialogue surrounding that, um, especially in fields and disciplines with colleagues that might be used to more traditional methods of uh, publications. And it's fine to have the monographs and the journals in hard copy, but it's also the idea to say, is there a way we can reach an untapped market, a broader base for those students who are enrolling and taking our classes that we can um, meet them where they are from day one and not add to the costs that we know are so high. Um, and I have incorporated these open educational resources both in face-to-face -face classes as well as online classes. And, and I think when you look at, um, you, know, you mentioned Habits of Mind, um, also AUX, all students will be taking um, two semesters of one and a half credit class to help with their transition to college and dealing with those deeper discussions on um, structures, power, equity, and diversity. And it's an all online resources model. So to try to say like what is the is the university both through CTRL and through elements of the core really saying that they value and this has made, you know, these efforts have been part of strategic planning from the president's office and also looking at efforts from um, the former provost. So to say like the university is behind this nationwide, there's a movement towards this and it's helping our students. And in helping our students, we may or may not be better teachers because of this, but they'll be better learners. And they'll be learning in an easier from that day one way. Awesome, thank you both. Um, and I think one thing that's important to pull out of both of these stories is that um, Right, teachers do pedagogy work all the time, right? You already spend a bunch of your time adapting resources for your course and figuring out which parts you want to teach and, and creating uh, ancillary materials to go with it. And so I think, um, you know, we talk a lot about how OER are free. And I think it is really important to be clear that OER are free for students, right? After they have been created, after they have been adapted. Um, and so we, I think, all believe really strongly that it's important to give faculty the time or the resources or whatever it takes to actually do this work, right? We're not expecting faculty members to just like suddenly write a textbook and then release it to the public for free. I mean, if you want to do that, we would certainly be grateful and that would be awesome. And many have chosen to do that. But um, we also try to be really realistic that it does take time, right? Like you both had to spend a good amount of time working with CTRL and, and investigating and sort of researching what you wanted to include. Um, so we do try to be realistic with that and we do try to provide resources um, for faculty who are making that choice. Um, and then the one other thing that I'll add um, is that too, uh, we talk about this mostly in terms of online resources, but uh, not all OER is online. It's certainly the easiest place to get it. But um, the OpenStax books that we had up earlier, they actually have a partnership with the National Association of College Stores. So they can stock print versions of those textbooks in your campus bookstore for like $40. Um, so it's someplace that the students can go if they prefer print, they can find it there, it's at their campus library, and it's, you know, 80% cheaper than what they might find from a traditional publisher. Um, so there's a lot of work there being done to make sure that they're not just online, but they're, you know, you can get physical copies as well. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, so then what's next? So the Open American program that both Michelle and Steph have worked with and I'm involved with now, have collectively saved since the summer of 2015 all the way through fall 2018. 
<laughs> like this is a huge number, $577,995 just in That's huge, that's a lot of money. And like Ethan mentioned before, it's there is a cost associated with creating and working through all of these you know, open resources, but this, I mean, it doesn't cost, a, it costs a fraction of that. Um, this is such an exciting movement to be a part of and to see that dollar amount, I think motivates me and pushes me forward even more. Um, so what can you do? So um, I think a good first step if you're new to OER is just to poke around our website, the Open American website. Um, it's on um, uh, our Headspace page, and it's also on this PowerPoint. Um, but see how you can incorporate them. Uh, you, you, know, you don't necessarily have to go from zero to 60 and really create your textbook now. Um, but see what's out there. See what's helpful for you, um, and you can use Steph's model too pulling in pieces from here and, and using a chunk from there. Um, see if anything looks great. Um, the other option that you can do in your search is you can review a textbook. Uh, that helps the peer review process. The textbooks are rigorously vetted and are constantly being checked by scholars who are examining these textbooks. And so you can participate in that as well. Um, and if you're interested in doing that, uh, talk to me. I'd love to, I'd love to you know, get your take on, on the textbook and see kind of next steps from there. Um, and then if you're really excited about OERs and see a real possibility with your own class, then let's talk definitely about creating a textbook uh, and textbooks. And um, I'll help you the whole way through. Um, as much as much support as you need is for as little as you need. Um, I am really excited about this and uh, Think that we can really make something really meaningful here as well. Um, that's me. What is the American Edspace? What is the URL? Yes, it is edspace.american. Oh, .american.edu slash ctrl slash open. I forgot what you said. <laughs> I think it's on slash open. It's either slash CTRL slash open or it's just open. Let's see. Nope. Okay. Go to uh, no. So then go to um uh space on that baby slash open. There it is. Ah. Okay. Yep. Um, so that's uh, where Michelle really started because we have a list of all of these places that you can go. Um, and also to openly uh, licensed resources that's not limited to just textbooks. So images are also available. Sound clips, music that you can use that's openly licensed and you can have these amazing CC little license there for your use. Um, and as long as you follow the you know, codes on the licenses, then good to go. Um, so there's a ton, ton of things that can be used in different capacities for sure. Great. Um, so happy to take some questions, maybe talk through what you're thinking, your impressions, etc. Um, so I'll, I'll say two really quick. Kim is a great resource, obviously. Um, Creative Commons is a global organization, but we're sort of really lucky that the U.S. headquarters is based here at the law school, so we have a bunch of lawyers who like helped found Creative Commons, and I work there full time doing this sort of thing. So you can also, if you are running into copyright questions, we also work on fair use stuff, um, and any questions about CC licensing, things like that, we can be a resource about that as well. It's amazing that we have Ethan <laughs> over just. <laughs> Down the bus route, it's uh, pretty incredible to have this very close partnership with the comments. So throughout, we threw a lot of information at you, and I think there are a bunch of things that I probably should have said that I probably missed. But um, I saw some sort of squinting. I saw some nodding heads. So um, we wanted to make sure we saved a good chunk of time for just questions, thoughts, things like that. Yeah. Um. Maybe for Kim and um, both instructors, um, what, uh, what 
when you create your OER material, after that, how do you get them to the computer? Is that a required step before you put the right so the sources are actually peer reviewed already. And so sometimes I see some errors too and I correct them myself. So you are sure that what you're putting together is actually very reputable. So it's the sources that we assign to our students, knowing that, you know, especially for programs that have certain benchmarks or curricular guidelines, you want to make sure that X amount of sources are coming from you know, peer reviewed scholarly journals or publications, and then feeling confident that OpenStax textbooks, among other um, openly licensed and available textbooks and resources, are peer reviewed so that it can meet you know, your pedagogical goals or your departments. There are quite a few initiatives too that encourage other scholars to review the textbooks. So I'm sure that your textbook has been reviewed several times. Uh, so it's, it's part of the community to have that. Um, and I think it's a good gateway for a lot of faculty to look at other textbooks at home. So. Yeah, and I, and I think too, um, like most things in academics, it's a it's a ecosystem that's policed by itself, right? Like academics, you read your book before you assign it to your students to make sure that it's right and it aligns with what you want to teach. And it's certainly helpful to get peer reviews and there are, right, as Kim said, a bunch of things. The Open Textbook Library has been actively recruiting reviewers for its open books for almost five years now. Um, but at the same time, right, like it's it's similar to any other academic industry where like, you know, the experts in the field read it. If you're teaching it, you read it. And if there are errors, the difference is you can correct them and you can send a note back to the author and they'll correct it, you know, on their their master copy immediately, unlike you know a publisher who might put out a book that calls slaves you know workers <laughs> and takes six months or a year to get new copies of that book out in the field. Um, so that's really positive. And then the other thing that I'll push on just a little bit is sort of how we define quality. We have a really strong connotation, obviously, that you know if it's free, you get what you pay for. But um, you know, no one ever looks at like a Pearson textbook and asks how effective is this as a teaching tool, right? There's no studies actually analyzing the effectiveness of those books in communicating the research, uh, communicating the information. We are actually doing that in the open space, analyzing the impact of books on student learning, on, on students' performance, um, and trying to demonstrate that quality is not just about the nice cover image, it's about the effectiveness and, and communicating. I think that we need stupid questions, but how are these books going to be so exorbitant? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think the textbooks are separate from, from college because we're talking about publishers rather than um, educational institutions. So, so the two track actually very closely. They've both increased like three or four times the rate of inflation over the past few decades. Um, my past work, I did research on this because I worked for a student advocacy group, um, but the, there's basically two things. The first is a lack of competition in the marketplace. There's only five publishers. They control 80% of the market. Um, and also, if you notice, they compete on very few books, right? Like Campbell's Biology is the biology textbook. You don't see the other major publishers going out and publishing a big biology textbook, which you know, I, there are some parties interested in actually investigating that for antitrust reasons, but that's a separate thing. So there's lack of competition. And then the other piece, and I think this is the real one, is that um, it's not a traditional consumer market, right? Like if you want to buy a car, you can go to the Ford dealer, you can look at a four-door SUV. If it's too expensive, you go down the road to a different dealer and buy a different four-door SUV. Um, in the textbook market, it's sort of like prescription drugs which is also a market where you see costs. You know, the person who pays for it doesn't have any decision-making authority, right? They don't choose which book to get, right? There's some options now they can rent, they can get a used one, they can download it legally. Um, but ultimately, the student has no decision-making on whether, on which book to buy, 
Um, so the professor is saying, look, they don't pay the cost. And they are increasingly mindful of cost, which is really great. Um, but it means that publishers can raise that price without any fear of market pushback, because the buyer has no, no say. So I'd say those are the two factors that allow prices to get so high. I'm a librarian, it kind of reminds me of the journal reference we talked yep. about before, because you know, with these journals and their prices increasing, we really don't have, I mean, we can't like not carry the right. journals that are back. The UC system can, because they are responsible for 10% of all research output in the world, that they can push back on Elsevier. But right, like most universities don't have the ability to just say, oh, our research, you know, our other journals. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Our faculty don't need journals anymore. Right. For sure. Um, you had a question. Perhaps. So my situation is I found a last year I reviewed 19 different textbooks looking to replace the one that we use in the business school. I'm a coordinator for the core business information systems class at two and And 12 of them were open access. Um, 11 of them were just way out of date. So information systems changes to some degree. I mean, there's some stuff that, that doesn't change stuff. So one semester, I just went rogue. And in my sessions, sections, I used the open access textbook. And then I supplemented it with other things. So I have a, an observation and then I have a question. So at one point, I suggested to my colleagues, many of whom teach, I've been here for five years, been teaching much longer than I am. I said, do we really even need a textbook? I mean, the, the internet is the, is the greatest information sharing tool in the history of history. And effectively, each edition of unit of information a student or anybody gets, effectively it's free. Each month, the marginal cost is zero. And my colleague said, eh, the problem with 200 level students is that most of them are going to need a textbook. If you, like I also teach the graduate version of this course, and there is, there is no textbook, but obviously there's a maturity level. So just in the terms of like getting rid of the textbook, which I thought, who needs textbooks, right? Um, but then my question has to do with this textbook I found is pretty good and it has some stuff that's useful, but I forget who mentioned, I think it was Michelle mentioned that um, even though the book that we use now is an ebook is only $30, okay, so as a percentage of our tuition it's minuscule, but still students come and say, why'd you make me buy the book if we're not going to read all the chapters, which is a really good question. So I want to do something like what you're doing. We also have a team project that is somewhat unique to AU, and I want to put the team project chapter in the book. It has to do with emerging technology, which is a topic we talked about, but I want that to be a transition from, I read the book we talked about in class, and now we're in our project, we're doing it together. So I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are about our experiences with taking somebody else's work, and I, I'm, I forget which Creative Commons license the name is, but it's the most liberal. It's like you can do anything with it, you can change it, you can sell it. It's probably CC by it's it's that. Yeah. And I also contacted the um, I also contacted the author uh, who did it under a grant from forget someplace, and if he would be okay if I if I did it, and he said yes. So what are your thoughts about taking someone else's work? But like doing kind of what you did and saying, I want to make sure that students get to the end and say, well, there wasn't a bunch of extra stuff in it, even though it's good. So for my case, I didn't have that problem because I just got everything from a single textbook. But for your case, I think you would be better able to answer that question. Yeah. Um, when someone puts a CCBY or any kind of license on Creative Commons, I think the expectation is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that and, and expectation and your hope is that someone would come along and actually use it and change it for their purposes. I think that you could definitely put that into your uh, textbook as either an appendix or a part of an activity. And then from you, you know, putting that into a textbook in OER, then that could be used by other places. So this great pedagogical idea and activity that you have could be used in other places. And it will always be attributed to you at American University. Um, I think that you know your textbook has some problems and questions in right. it, right? Like there's some activities. It's not like it's just content and information, but there is interaction in it. So I think you could definitely do that. Yeah, I, 
that's the that's the hope. Like that's the goal. And and so it, it's actually you know there are some limitations because a lot of the OER that's out there right now isn't shared in an editable format, which is you know troublesome because. You know, we sort of we rely on these five things. These are called the five R's. It, these are just the the basic permissions that come with an open license: is to retain it, reuse it, revise it, and remix it. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And so, under a CC license, you you can tear that book apart. You can keep five chapters. You can add in your own. And as long as you give attribution to the original for the original content, that is a totally acceptable use. Um, the question comes down to like, how do you do that? What soft, you know, what software do you use? How do you, you know, combine the materials technologically? Um, and that's something we need to do better at as a community is publishing editable formats of things. Um, but yes, totally. So I have a follow-on question. One of the reasons why uh, I initially didn't adopt this textbook is, as opposed to the, the paid textbook, is that. The paid textbook, even though it's only thirty dollars, it comes with lots of like it comes with all the slides, it comes with instructor manuals, lots and lots of supporting material. So we have a number of adjuncts that teach the class, and so to be able to say, here's the book, and here's I also have some lesson plans I share with them. But more or less, it's kind of a self-contained thing. This open access with just the book. So what I did one one semester I went rogue is that the, the six or seven chapters that I ended up using, I created that extra content. So I would like to, if this is going to be successful, and I'm not sure what the definition is, probably a couple, but let's just define success as students have readily free access to useful stuff that's complete and is, um, is up to date, then there has to be supporting material. And if I'm going to get my colleagues to use, I'm going to call it my textbook, then I can't really say, well, you gotta make your own slides. And I gotta hand them some self contained kind of thing. So, does that kind of fall under this as well? I mean, could there be some sort of a, a package that, you know, like resources for faculty, resources for students kind of thing? So, the short answer is yes. We know we need more of that in this space, right? Like, there are there's some, right? Like, OpenStax books come with a PowerPoint and a test bank for the most part. Um, but we know that like this is the area where the open community is most lacking in and the place that is also one of the biggest barriers to adoption, right? Like faculty, you need test banks, you need you know, PowerPoints, you need things like that. Um, so I think our goal is to like different groups are working on sprints where they'll actually get like a hundred educators together and they'll just create ancillary kind of pick a book, create, you know, a hundred test questions and all of that stuff and get that out into the onto the internet. Um, and then also like make funds available for faculty to do that. Right? Like if you're gonna spend the time making that stuff, you should get paid. Um, so the answer is yes, we need those things. <laughs> We're trying to do that more, but there is still room to grow. Because I see that as a huge barrier to adoption, just without the supportive stuff. I mean if it's a one-off class, and you know, but if I'm going to get my colleagues to adopt it, there's no way that you know, even if it's the best book in the world, there's no way they're going to adopt it. We've spoken on panels with someone from Econ, who synced it with tests and other assignments, and it worked really effectively. So it, it's done, and and I think there's also, you know, where faculty land in terms of how much time you have. To invest and also the ROI. It's something that's a super popular course that's getting taught multiple sections each semester and on the summer. Then the investment, you know, to getting it done and having it with the slides and other, you know, faculty resources is worth it for a class where you're saying, okay, there's two of us teaching it. Um, I was going to have to redo it next year anyway. Now I actually have the chance to redo it with someone from CTRL bouncing ideas back. Mm -hmm. I kind of found it. I probably, yeah, I might say it took me a little bit more time, but not much. And it was nice to have someone to bounce ideas off of with respect to curriculum and options. Well, we charge our students about two dollars and twenty-five cents a minute to come to class. So I think that mm -hmm. I think that this is something that we kind of totally on board with, with what you're doing. That's great. Presentation success. <laughs> um, you also have a question. Um, yeah, I was wondering how this translates to um, 
I, I'm not in law school, but I have a lot of friends who are in law school who spend, I mean, they spend more money on textbooks than anyone I know. Um, it helps relate to like case books and, and things like that, which are, I have, I'm not sure if they're accessible. I would not think they would be. Um, yeah, most are, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's a very, there's a lot of similarities to like the legal case book market to the, the sort of traditional publishing market. Um, so there are efforts there too, um, you know, like um, I think Harvard has an open law project where they're just like digitizing and publicly sharing as much of the current U.S. legal code and like state legal codes and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot of them there. And these can be particularly agile as well. So if there's a new case or something that comes out, I'm not sure if it will be quicker. I'm not a lawyer either. Um, but if you know if something develops, then that could be added. I mean, there's some time, but it could be you know it could take a few days. This is a whole publishing cycle year. Other questions. So I had a question about an early slide. It's more of a student behavior question. 10.34% um, use course reserve. And so that's such an interesting gap between, I know this is important. I know that I'm missing out on important information. It's on reserve in the library, but I'm not going to go use it there. Like there's, and I, I, I'm lazy too, so I kind of get it, but I also feel like that's just such a big jump between it's too expensive for me to buy it, and I'm not going to bother to walk into the library and get it off course reserves. Yeah, I think practically it's how many copies are available in the library, um, how long is the assignment, and, and when, you know, the idea, you can, you can put it for two hours or 24 hours. If most people, most students aren't doing their work that much more in advance, so I think that's a big piece of it. Who's who's planning ahead and reading over the weekend for a class on Wednesday versus who's going on Tuesday to say, okay, there's one book on on reserve. If I don't get it, I can't use it. And then I think there's the piece of, well, what if that that book on reserve was also connected with a paper or a final or a project, and what does that look like for the students then? to only have one copy accessible and then you know how big are the classes do there need to be more books on reserve are you offering up your own copy to students you know how many options are there and then do, do students feel comfortable sharing that you know that's a tricky thing for me um i you know i've heard of, of you know some assignments where it was oh you cited the textbook just not enough go back and redo the whole the whole paper and then in the back of my head i'm thinking is it that they just didn't have the textbook and that they were trying to work with, you know, a two-hour window at the library. And we post reserves too. So the textbook, in order for the library to purchase it or have it on reserve, um, automatically is $150 and above. Um, the list is very large, and the most expensive textbook on campus is $350. For one class, I just, it just bores me. Um, so it could be that the textbook is $120, and it's not fair. Um, it also could be a public publicity thing. You might not even know. Um, I can't. The book, the book we use in, in our course is it's an ebook, but it's also available as a hard copy, mm -hmm. which I requested. And yesterday I put it on reserve. Uh -huh. Now there's only one book for seven sections, but it seems to me that well, I can't I can't speak outside the business school, but I think every course I've ever taught there was an instructor version of the instructor never I never had to pay for any of the books. It seems to me that'd be a relatively easy thing to get at least one copy of the book. And maybe that's something I mean again if you have multiple sections then it doesn't really help. But um, there are scanners. So you know when you say oh okay it's only a three hour window, but there are book scanners right there, like five feet away. That's you true. can scan what you need for that week's assignment, only have the book in your possession for 15 minutes. And still get what you need. Yeah. Great. So. Well, no, it's and this. I but, think but, but, but so maybe it's an awareness thing, like. Yeah. And then how much money? You know, is it free to fully scan? Because there's a budget for. Yeah. yeah, you can scan. Yeah. You can scan. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not it's a bit less for free, but you can scan and email a PDF to yourself. Well, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. I think 
and and like this is not to impugn the library. Like yeah, you know, no, library is like I, and like I understand. Like, <laughs> I'm lazy and I get it, but I also feel like that's just such a big jump between. I know this is important. I recognize that this is a problem, and it's over here, and I'm not going to go get it for free. So I just I'm, I'm wondering what we can do to address that behavioral gap. So one one statistic that I do because I, I think this is not this doesn't quite accurately represent the full picture because. If st libraries, if you actually look at the most checked out books, uh, the consistently the top ten are okay. library reserves, right? So, you know, and you've talked to libraries whose books like are checked out twenty four hours, like students coming in at four to six in the morning to get that window, um, and and it's just not practical. Like ten percent, this could be you know one book. If you calculate the total number of hours available in the semester for seven sections, 10% could be like that book has been checked out 24 seven for a semester and it still only reached 10% of students. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's publicity like a lot of students just don't know. I think, I think they may be worried about scanning, like they may think that they're doing something illegal. Um, and then I think the third part is like physically, it's just not possible to stock all of the sections and all of the, you know, the, the numbers that you want. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you're saying that as a student, graduate uh, student, but um, I, I believe that many students are, especially currently because of the financial challenges with education, are really resourceful. Like when it comes to using, finding materials in creative ways. And I know a lot of people who really try to use the library, but nothing, it's just not available because it's all checked out. Um, and getting access to other books from other libraries in, in stock is hard too because it takes time. You know, it's just we're constantly moving. So I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily laziness, but I think it, yeah, it's. Students are pretty resourceful, but I think it has more to do with that time to check out of a book. If you were just my So this illegal downloads not everything. It's <laughs> not reflective of yeah. <laughs> for some reason they're not self-reporting. Well, right. Yeah. It's probably more like probably a little more. Than that. Yeah. Um, so we are out of time, but thank you all so much. Um, give these guys a round of applause.